Today, I want to speak about Roy DeMeo's murder. I know it's been spoken about and highlighted numerous times. However, there's always a wider angle view of things. As most of us know, Roy DeMeo had a crew, the DeMeo crew, of all capable guys who, with DeMeo, took killing to another level. A typical mob hit is quick and over in seconds, and sometimes, in an effort to conceal the body, the victim was buried. The DeMeo crew, conversely, were known for dismembering its victims, so much so that other crews were bringing them their victims who they wanted to disappear. You've heard me say, you don't pick the mob, the mob picks you. And in DeMeo's case, the mob really didn't want him. Initially, while an associate of Nino Gaggi, Gambino boss Paul Castellano, said no to Gaggi's suggestion inducting DeMeo. And let me just add, it's not a good sign when the boss of a family is the one knocking you down. Typically, at that point, you're done and you better get used to being an associate. According to reports, DeMeo doubled up his efforts, being fully aware that in that life, money talks, and being a good earner, made the blind see. He began kicking up more money, in essence, trying to buy his button, which many guys have done, because the smell of money is like an aphrodisiac to wise guys. There are a great deal of wise guys today who are in that life because of their earning capabilities. In their case, in place of a pistol is a knot of bills. I've spoken about how earners are protected by bosses. That's their bread and butter. For example, I mentioned as far as the Lucchese family, if you had a beef with either Sal or Carmine Avellino, Matty Madonna's decision was already against you before you even sat down. As for DeMeo, it took more than money to sway Castellano. He was rich in his own right and had many big earners grease in his palm. I remember reading something about how Castellano was saying how disgraceful the porn business was, and Robert DiBernardo, arguably one of the biggest guys in the business, stated that Castellano had no problem taking boxes of money handed to him from their very business. Another sign of the double standards in their life. The Mayo's big break came in the form of a headache called the Westies, which was the Irish mob out of Hell's Kitchen. The Mayo took out Westie boss Mickey Spillane, which cemented a close working relationship with Spillane's successor, Jimmy Coonan. So when Castellano wanted to rein in the Westies, and bring them under the Gambino flag, of course with a 10% tax of their profits, and naturally using them to his advantage, it was DeMeo who played a big role in making that happen. Subsequently, Gaggi again advocated for his induction, and this time Castellano gave in and okayed it. Prior to being inducted, DeMeo already had a crew, so following his induction, he hit the ground running. There's no question about it, DeMeo was a capable guy. But what ultimately gave him the power was the crew he had behind him. In return, that crew now had a rabbi in DeMeo. Any beefs they got into, DeMeo could now go and speak on their behalf. It's one of the benefits an associate has, being able to go to his guy to step in when there's a problem. Although when an associate keeps having problems, he's looked at as a liability rather than an asset. In that life, guys are always trying to win favor with the boss. And most of a boss's knowledge about what's going on out in the street comes from the information he's receiving. With that said, you could believe Castellano was well aware of what the DeMeo crew was up to, especially in the building that held the Gemini Lounge, which was literally a body chop shop. During that time, DeMeo and his crew earned a fearsome reputation, which was good PR for the Gambino family, and naturally gave Castellano more power. Aside from making money, Castellano's number one concern was remaining free. He didn't want to be sent to prison, and more importantly, he wasn't about to let anyone put him there if he could help it. What's interesting is, the mayor wasn't considered a cowboy by all his money-making schemes, which included drug dealing, schemes that put money in Castellano's pocket. And he wasn't considered a cowboy when the entire mob knew he had an assembly line-like operation to dismember bodies. But as soon as Castellano felt law enforcement's heat, he immediately viewed the mayor as a cowboy. When in fact, Castellano knew he was a cowboy from the very beginning, which is why he didn't want to straighten him out. I've learned and witnessed firsthand the many hypocrisies when it comes to that life. For instance, in further regard to Castellano, he targeted the Gotti crew for their drug dealing. And when he did, he exercised full-blown protocol. You get caught dealing drugs, you die. Yet his relatives, the Cherry Hill Gambinos, also members of the family, could fill up warehouses with all the heroin they trafficked. In regard to that situation, as the saying goes, pressure bursts pipes. And by putting all that pressure on the Gotti crew, eventually Castellano burst his own pipe. 
With all that the Mayo had going on, he definitely didn't help himself. In April 1979, he mistakenly mistook an 18-year-old college student, Dominic Ragucci, who was working as a door-to-door -door vacuum salesman for a Cuban cartel shooter. Supposedly, this was the result of a bad cocaine deal that went sour with the Cubans. Making De Mayo paranoid and on high alert, he spotted the kid parked by his house in Massapequa, Long Island, which led to a car chase, and he winds up shooting this kid seven times. News of Ragucci's murder, and above that, De Mayo's blunder, angered both Castellano and Gaggi, which for De Mayo was very bad because now he lost his advocate. Mob murders naturally bring law enforcement heat, but the murder of an innocent 18-year-old brings much unwanted heat. The final nail in DeMeo's coffin came in the form of a member of his crew, Vito Arena. After being arrested on June 4, 1981, by Brooklyn's auto crime squad, Arena began cooperating with both the NYPD and the FBI. As a result of the information provided by him, the ongoing investigation into DeMeo and his crew widened. In July 1981, DeMeo was served a federal grand jury subpoena out of Newark, New Jersey. The FBI in Jersey was investigating DeMeo's auto theft ring, in which DeMeo's crew was selling the stolen cars and exporting them to Kuwait. According to reports, DeMeo did go to Castellano and Gaggi to not only notify them about the subpoena, but to break the news about Arena cooperating. You could only imagine what was going through Castellano's head as he listened to this news. Around this same time, bugs were placed in Angelo Ruggiero's house in Cedarhurst, Long Island. Initially, the bugs were in regard to the FBI investigating loan sharking and gambling. But as we know, those tapes included talk of heroin deals, which caused all the pressure from Castellano, as mentioned earlier. Nonetheless, one of the captured conversations between Ruggiero and Gene Gotti had to do with Roy DeMeo. Apparently, Gene Gotti explained that Castellano wanted DeMeo hit, and his brother John was given the task, along with Frankie DeChico. He also mentioned how his brother was skeptical because DeMeo had an army of killers around him. I don't believe, or at least I haven't read anything, stating that the FBI, after listening to that tape, paid DeMeo a visit to warn him that his life was in danger. Maybe they did, or it's possible they couldn't locate him to give him the warning. I believe after receiving the subpoena, the mayo went into semi-hiding. As I mentioned, Castellano compiled a laundry list of things against the mayo, like unsanctioned hits. But again, these are things that Castellano was aware of for years, and the money the mayo was kicking up outweighed any of his sins. We've now come to the point for the reason of this video. In the early 80s, the mob was thriving. Some would say they were at their strongest. If the West Side, the Genovese family, was viewed to be at the top, Arguably, the Gambinos held the number two slot. Unlike today, back then, families consisted mostly of capable guys, crews of them, like the Gotti crew or the DeMeo crew. I believe what gets lost in the shuffle is some of the facts. You have Paul Castellano, the boss of a family, who decides he wants to have a member hit. His reasoning is purely self-preservation, but truth be told, he didn't need any reason. He's the boss and what he says goes. In turn, he calls in two of his captains and explains what he wants. Most likely, he wanted them to put their heads together so they could get it done. The Gambino family as a whole has carried out untold amounts of hits. After Castellano voiced his wishes, that should have been the end of it. Whether it took a week, weeks, or even months, the Gambino family should have performed house cleaning and took the mayo out. It's been suggested that John Gotti feared Roy DeMeo. Personally, I don't believe that. John Gotti was just as capable with the crew of killers just like the male. It can be looked at that Gotti dragged his feet and didn't put any effort into even attempting to hit the male. For starters, he knew if the male spotted any of his crew laying on him, he'd go after him personally. But let's not forget, Gotti was not a fan of Castellano in the least. So it's quite possible he hoped that the male would flip and give Castellano up, which would put Della Croce in charge and Gotti in a great position. After all, Della Croce was his guy. Understandably, the mayo was far from an easy target, but anyone can be got. According to what's known, it was De Chico's idea to approach Gaspipe and the Lucchese's. It was well known both Vic and Gas were close to the Gemini twins, Anthony Center and Joey Testa. So who better to set the mayo up than members of his own crew? Strategically, it made all the sense in the world, but technically, if you think about it, it was one family having to go to another to handle an in-house problem. 
if you have to outsource another family to do your dirty work, it could be looked at as a weakness. Not that other families have not done the same, but the Gambino should have been able to handle it, which only adds strength to the theory of Gotti hoping DeMeo would eventually give Castellano up, which by the way, when the FBI tried to bait DeMeo into talking, he didn't. But who knows in the end what would happen. Before I take a second to mention the ad, I didn't implement Patreon and charge people for subscriptions, which maybe I should have. So the super thanks icon is the only form of revenue for this channel. If you'd like to donate, you could click on the three dot drop down to show appreciation for videos like this. As we know, on January 10th, 1983, Roy DeMeo was lured to Patty Tester's auto garage in Brooklyn. And supposedly, while he was sipping coffee, he was shot more than a dozen times. We also know the agreement between the Gambino family and the Lucchese's was for them to convince the Gemini twins to turn on DeMeo and take him out. Their reward for doing so would be their release to the Lucchese family and eventually straightened out. In the end, Castellano got his wish at the cost of losing two valuable guys in the process. But little did he care, he had a new bug up his ass, the Gotti crew, which didn't end very well for him.